the TLDW. When you have an access of older generation chips, just slap a newer label on the video card that uses them and then sell them as new generation cards. And while this would land your average Joe in prison, companies like Nvidia or Asus can get away scot-free. I initially planned this video to be a light-hearted review of a Kepler GT730, but lucky you, all 20 of you at the time of writing the script. Besides the review, you'll also get to hear me rant about this and even dare to make a prediction. Let's start with the GT1030, a case which was also covered by Gamers Nexus, link to their video in the description. I was able to find three versions of this card, all of them being marketed with the same name. One uses the Pascal GP108 with the GDDR5, launched in May 2017. One using the same GP108 but paired with DDR4 and launched in March 2018. And another one using the Kepler GK107 and GDDR5, launched in September 2018. Let's continue with the GT710 family. Your best 710, that's the Kepler based one with GDDR5. The variants, well, how about swapping the GDDR5 for DDR3, like in the one released in March 2014? Yes, that's the same kind of swap with the second GT1030. And for swapping the GPU, well, let me present you the Fermi based one released about two years later. This one is even worse than the last GT1030. It swaps both the GPU and the memory for the less powerful options. As for the GT730, well, we have a similar situation. Kepler GPUs and Fermi GPUs mixed up with DDR3 and GDDR5, albeit in a more predictable fashion. DDR3 implies Fermi, while GDDR5 is for Kepler. In all cases, we can see the same video card name slapped on GPUs from multiple architectures and memory subsystems. The GTX 650s and the Kepler GT1030 variants use the same chip. The GT430 shares the same GF108 with the Fermi GT730. This seems to be Nvidia's MO when it comes to excess stock of various GPUs. They get used in what is ultimately a bait and switch scheme, where manufacturers initially release video cards using the better GPUs, to then silently switch to the stock of unsold older chips. So why this rant? Why now? Well. Besides me recently getting a Fermi GT730 while expecting a Kepler one, it's also about the current market. Nvidia has an excess stock of Ampere GPUs, and while the 4030s cards don't need to use GA chips, since they'll coexist with the 30 series anyway, the 530s up to 550s might see a stealth comeback of Ampere, and the 6030 quite likely. Lest we forget, History repeats itself. Now, on to our GT430. Sorry, GT530. No, wait. Um, GT630. No, darn. Um, 730. This is so confusing. The Fermi GF108 was released in October 2010 in the GT430 card and has 96 shader cores, 16 TMUs and 4 ROBs. It uses PCIe 2.0 times 16 and while it is clocked at 700 MHz, my sample card can be overclocked to 850. My Asus sample pairs the GPU with 2 GB of DDR3 memory via a 128-bit bus. The VRAM is clocked by default at 800 MHz. And while my sample card was happy with it overclocked to 950, it started to artifact at 1000 MHz. 
Driver support for this card is a horrible experience for the typical user. On the NVIDIA page, selecting GT730 as printed on the video card will download you the latest legacy driver for the Kepler architecture. This will obviously not install, leaving the user scratching their heads as to why they can't install the latest drivers for their card. Knowing that this is actually a Fermi chip, selecting GT430 will provide you the correct driver... Mm, correct. Um, let's rephrase that. A driver package that will install and run. This will prove to be problematic and we'll see that in the gaming benchmark section. Since the 49 watts TDP of the card is about the one of a Core i3 CPU, Asus used the same aluminum flower style cooler that we've seen on the R7 250 and quite similar to the one used for said i3. Using a 2-pin fan that lacks the tachometer signal, the card cannot report the RPM properly. However, the power delivered to the fan is PVM controlled, so it will allow different RPMs according to load. Despite using a cheap cooling solution, the car does not heat up under load at stock frequencies. It remains at 62C in heaven for a delta over ambient of 38C. In Warframe, the temperature went up by 5 degrees. At the 850 MHz overclock, things got toasted by 21C, hitting 88C in Warframe. These values were captured after repasting the card. The firing range tutorial from Apex Legends is not playable, not even by single player standards at 720p low settings. The average FPS reached 16 FPS and the 1% lows were close to it at 11 FPS. Don't play this game with the GT430, 530, 630, 730 Fermi card. Call of Duty Warzone won't even launch due to a DirectX error, probably related to the older driver version. And no, despite the card being labeled GT730, you cannot install the latest Kepler supported driver. Battlefield 5 was more frank about it. It refused to launch and placed the blame on the driver version. It however guides the user to download and install the latest drivers for Kepler, which won't install. Thank you Asus and Nvidia for using the same name on different cards, but not providing the same level of driver support. Control is a single player game, so lower FPS is acceptable. But a single digit average FPS at 720p low settings is not. At 9 FPS, the game should be avoided by owners of GF108 based cards. Rainbow Six Siege tried to be kind to us suckers using the GT730 with the old Fermi chip. It booted into the game, allowed changing settings, but blocked the benchmark button and provided a message in the top left corner for this. If you called it it's due to the drivers, you'd be correct. Alien Isolation is supposed to be a game easy to run on TX11 cards. Our GT430, 530, 630, 730 card struggles however even at 720p, albeit ultra settings. 29 FPS average is almost playable, but the 1% lows of 21 will be difficult to ignore. Overclocking the card however raises the average to 37 and 1% lows to 26. And that is actually enough to make the experience borderline enjoyable. CSGO runs well on slower hardware, or at least that's what I kept saying in all other videos. 
The Fermi based GT730 really stretches this. At even in 720p low settings, it fails to reach a good FPS for a multiplayer title. The game averaged 49 FPS with a janky 19 FPS 1% lows. Overclocking the card raised the average FPS dramatically to 74 FPS, but the 1% lows of 27 FPS remained lacking. Dota 2 seems to like Nvidia cards. Even the GF108 base card managed to net an average of 82 FPS, albeit at 720p low settings, full render scale. The 1% lows at 46 FPS is in the range, this is fine. Fortnite ran almost fine at 720p, performance mode and view distance set too far. The average of 55 FPS is close enough to that magical 60 to get the game to play ok. The 1% lows of 28 are a bit low for a multiplayer game. The Fermi based GT730 won't help much in winning a game, but it will allow you to enjoy it. Overclocking the card proved to be quite beneficial with the average creeping up to almost 70 FPS and the 1% lows getting closer to 40, much more adequate for playing this title. Rocket League was playable at 1080p low settings with the scale set to 100%. The average frame rate is 47 and the 1% lows is 17 FPS. The performance is much better at 720p, where the average goes up to 67 FPS and the 1% lows to 23. This happens to be a game where we did benchmark the OC GT4, 5, 6, 730, whatever you want to call it. The average at 1080p went up to 66 FPS and 1% lows at 23 basically matching the performance at stock clocks at 720p resolution. And at the lower resolution, the overclocked card pulled 90 FPS on average and 31 FPS for the 1% lows. Now, I know that Rocket League is fairly easy to play, but I can't help but admire the performance of the tiny Fermi chip. While Split Game will run on the stock GT730 at 720p low settings, the performance is not good enough to allow surviving a regular multiplayer match. The average is at 43 FPS and the 1% lows is about 17. Overclocking will raise the performance to a 52 FPS average and 20 FPS 1% lows. While definitely better, is not quite good enough so I'd avoid this game when using the Fermi 30 cards. As usual, we use the spike planting training mission from Valorant to test the Fermi based GT730. At 1080p low settings, the card pulled 95 FPS on average and 63 FPS for the 1% lows. While the game is already playable at 1080p, I did test the card at 720p as well, where it managed an average of 145 FPS and 1% lows at 101 FPS. The game is definitely playable with this card. Genshin Impact struggles to reach a playable frame rate even at 720p, with an average FPS of 27 and 1% lows of 23. The 1080p performance is too poor to mention. Overclocking the card raised the average by less than 10% to 29 FPS, and 1% lows stayed at the same value as stock. Fortunately, the game is PV, so in a pinch, one can play it on the OC Fermi GT730. We benchmarked Paladins at 720p this time around, with the same mix settings like previous videos. The average was good at 99 FPS and the 1% lows of 66 was also adequate. Surprisingly, one cannot blame the old Fermi 30 card for losing the match. 
Realm Royale performed significantly lower at similar 720p settings. I put the blame for this on the paltry amount of ROPs, having to build frames on environments with a lot more geometry. The average FPS was in the low 40s and the 1% lows hovering around 23 FPS. Overclocking the card however got the average FPS closer to what's needed for a multiplayer game with a value of 61 FPS. Rogue Company provides similar values as Realm Royale at the same 720p resolution. The game runs at 45 FPS and 1% lows are at 24 FPS on the GT730. Not quite good for the multiplayer title. Fortunately for the Fermi GT X30 cards, overclocking them gets the average up to 54 FPS and 1% lows to 26. Still not 60 FPS but already playable, so yes, keep this title installed, even if the only card that you have is the Fermi 730. World of Tanks Blitz stayed at 60 FPS on average at 720p, and the 1% lows reached 59 FPS. This is adequate for this slower paced multiplayer game, so just like Rogue Company or Fortnite, you can still enjoy this game even with the Fermi 730. At this point, everybody that watched the previous videos from this channel already knows the layout of the Mariana Grenier base by heart. Still, Warframe is a good game to test, because the temperatures reached in this game make it for a realistic torture test. The FPS however reached 39 on average and 10 FPS for 1% lows at 720p. Even for a PvE title however, this is on the low side. Temperatures reached about 67C, which is still quite low for a GPU. Overclocking the card provided the most remarkable results, bringing up the average to 65 FPS and 1% lows to 45. This is definitely in the playable realm for multiplayer games, never mind PvE games. However, the temperatures went higher by 21C, heating up the GPU to 88C. Basically, even the tiny GF108 Fermi GPU can live up to the expectations set by its bigger brothers. I was looking for a Kepler-based GT730 to help out with video decoding for a PC that uses the good old Sandbridge i5-2400. Having a discrete GPU would also help with video drivers for Windows 10, since the HD 2000i GPU from Sandybridge is not supported officially. The card I set my eyes on also needed repairs, making it cheaper than anything else on the market. And since I enjoy doing repairs on GPUs, see the link in the description, I decided to buy it. I was quite disappointed to see the Fermi GPU on the PCB when disassembling it. However, after repairing it, I used it as my daily driver for a bit and I did notice that the GPU usage was going high on video playback. So mission accomplished, I guess. Should you get a Fermi based 30 card? Only if you want a cheap display adapter, think $10 or less and you don't mind playing only easier to run titles at 720p low settings. If the asking price gets closer to $15 or higher, my suggestion is to call pass on it. You see, if you're patient, you can get a much more powerful R7 250 for less than 20 USD, or once in a blue moon, an even more powerful HD 7770 at less than 25 USD. And another one using the Jepler... Uh, the Jepler. 